Matt Hancock has come third in I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, which is being generally lauded as a triumph for the former health secretary. Jim Waterson wrote this in The Guardian. Voting statistics released by ITV on Monday show how Hancock's decision to join the show, driven by a supposed desire to promote dyslexia to a wider audience and a reported £400,000 fee, paid off. In the final, he won 22% of the public vote. While ITV does not reveal how many members of the public take part in I'm a Celebrity polls, the number of people who voted for Hancock is likely to be substantially higher than the number of people who voted in this summer's Tory leadership election. Hundreds of thousands of Britons apparently repeatedly spent 50p on a premium rate phone line or sent text messages to express their support for Hancock. A peak audience of 11.5 million viewers watched Sunday night's final, where the Tory MP wore a snorkel before being submerged in water covered in eels and left with an amphibian on his head. While the vote results reveal Hancock was never in with a chance of beating the former England footballer Jill Scott to win the competition, making the final was a triumph in itself for a man predicted to be first out of the jungle. Hancock won over audience with his stoic approach to Bush Tucker trials, where contestants have to do things like crawl around in the dark with rats or eat items such as sheep's vaginas. Others were clearly won around by his pleas for forgiveness. This was an exchange early on in the series. I thought you broke lockdown rules. No, I did not. All right, I didn't break I any. You were socialising someone outside of your household. Yeah, that, I didn't break any laws. I, uh, guidance is different, but anyway, I don't want to go. Oh, into so there's that. a rule and there's a law. Guidance. The guidance is guidance. guidance. Right. But oh. the problem was Apart it was my police, guidance. Actually, exactly. Sort of. That's why. So why did you, you break your own guidance? Well, because it's guidance. I, it was a mistake. Because I fell in love with somebody, and we and all I was know taken what by love. Well, it's true. But you did it anyway. Well, it was. It, I, that's why I apologise for it. I feel very, you know. But it's that kind of you just do it, and then afterwards it's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, because it's bigger than that. It's not like a sort of thing. It's massively say, bigger sorry, than that. Sorry, sorry. I yeah. my aunt died from COVID in yeah. the first wave. Yeah. Right. So we couldn't go to the hospital to go and visit her. Yeah. I had to sit by myself in the church at her funeral. We couldn't hug each other because we were following guidance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I get that you fell in love. I understand all of those things. Yeah. But sorry for a lot of families like mine, it doesn't really cut it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there you go. And that's that. That's one of the reasons that I um, that I regret it as much as I do. Well done. Well done. Do you know what it is, actually? Mm. What I'm really looking for is a bit of forgiveness. That's what I'm really well looking for. Hey. Well, oh, my good. God, I nearly cried just then. Just well, so did I. You know what's really interesting is he asked for forgiveness. He didn't say sorry. There's a big difference. When you, when you ask for forgiveness, you're giving the agency over to the other person, which, of course, when you say sorry, you know, like David Baddiel with Jason Lee, oh, I'm sorry, you're not giving the person any agency, because they might, they might not forgive you. The forgiveness is, there to, is, is theirs to give you, not the other way around. And you can actually see in the, um, the immediate response to, to him saying he's looking for forgiveness. Because I believe, I think you're, you're probably quite similar, Michael. I believe people are inherently quite good on the whole. And if somebody is clearly showing contrition and they're sorry, and they ask for your forgiveness, generally speaking, you'll give it to them. And I think that tells you something about human nature. I think that's that's quite a different thing to him saying, I'm sorry, uh, it won't happen again or something. Of course, look, at the end of the day, it's all a performance. And 11.5 million watching this thing, Michael, is just blows my mind. You know, that's more than, that's more people watching that show than I think voted for any political party in the 2005 general election. But I can see why on a human psychological level, the other contestants in that moment responded to him in the way that they did. It helps to relate to the public if you fit into a type. And I think Matt Hancock on this show sort of fit into a type that people recognize, you know, awkward guy, a bit embarrassing, but they think ultimately, you know, kind of quirky, we'll let him get by, whatever. That seems to be the attitude to him. The few bits where I was watching it where I found it most sort of disgusting was sort of him describing, I went into politics to work with George Osborne to help him implement austerity. Because you know, it's just like, I can't think of a more evil motivation to have got you into politics. I decided I was going to make as a career making people's lives much more miserable. I actually find it much easier to forgive him. Not that I necessarily have, but I find it much more forgivable, some of the mistakes that were made over the COVID pandemic, because I do think that everyone would have made some mistakes and 
whatever mistake you made would have had some disastrous consequence. I mean, it was a very, very high stakes time. I think he, you know, made some mistakes that were unforgivable, but also it doesn't have the same sort of, I don't like to talk in this way, but going into politics to do austerity just strikes me as being like a bit evil, a bit sociopathic. Making some ups when sort of an unforeseen pandemic comes along, I can see how one might grant forgiveness for that. But it was those, it was that moment early on in the series. I think we did show it on a on an episode of this where I just feel like you, I cannot have any sympathy for anyone or relate to anyone remotely if they went into politics to cut the benefits of disabled people, to bully people, to constantly jump through weird hoops and ending up causing people to starve to death because they can't bear to to go to the job center anymore. You know, that's the kind of thing I think is completely unforgivable. Also worth noting, you know, Matt Hancock said, the thing I'm apologizing for is getting caught kissing on CCTV. He says the reason I did that is because I was in love. There is no sort of policy area that he has apologized for. The forgiveness is for kissing the girl. You know, so it's, it's not the most humble of, of attitudes. Yeah, your points about him living up to a certain archetype, which is, you know, we've all met somebody like that, not especially impressive or charismatic or handsome or, you know, front foot forward, but kind of he's quite disarming, unimpressive. How could somebody like that oversee such incredible pain and suffering? It brings you back to a phrase, you know, the banality of evil. Yes, people like Matt Hancock have overseen terrible things, actually. Far worse than what he did, by the way, as uh, Secretary of State for Health. Your point as well about him wanting to enter politics to help George Osborne to implement austerity is so, so important, Michael. You hear it all the time. Conservatives will say, look, nobody goes into politics to be a bad person, just like Labour MPs, just like the Lib Dems or the SNP. We're in it for public service. We're here to serve the public. And I really don't quite understand what that means when you were serving in the conservative Lib Dem coalition between 2010 and 2015, and we had 150, 160, 170,000 excess deaths as a result of austerity. What was the public service? To who? It wasn't a public service. It was a, a certain faction of the ruling class benefiting from about 20 to 25% of the rest of the country being absolutely screwed. And you were the people administering that and doing the PR and talking to camera and talking to the newspapers and the radio every day so that that stuff could happen. It could get you know, past the British public and some people could make their profits and other people could freeze to death in their homes. So yeah, that idea of public service, I just find so, so puzzling. You know, who are you helping? Who are you serving? It's certainly not the public. It's a very small group of people. Um, but like you say, I think Matt Hancock, in an almost not unique way, because there are other people like him, but he's such a, you know, a, an explicitly mopey, unimpressive, disarming person. I think that's why he gets away with it. Many other conservative MPs, or just MPs generally, they wouldn't have found the same kind of response as he did. Mm -hmm.